Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's session. This is uh, Engineered Tax Services Compliance to Advisory. Are you sur surviving or thriving with Heidi Henderson? Um, Heidi's going to do a quick introduction shortly, but I just wanted to welcome everyone to today's program and let you know that you can ask Heidi questions throughout the session using the Q&A um, option there at the bottom of the screen. So please feel free to do that and she'll take them as she presents throughout the day. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. And thank you, Heidi, so much for presenting today. Absolutely. Dee, thanks so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, so as Dee had mentioned, I have the Q&A panel open. Um, and let's see, I believe there's a chat panel as well. Uh, nope, I just have a Q&A panel. So if you have any questions, if you have any comments as we're going, or you want to have me kind of circle back around on anything specific, um, drop it into that Q&A panel. I will be kind of checking that and looking at that from time to time as we're going. I want to make sure and answer any questions as we have and, and try to have some dialogue. Even though we're not live, we're, um, we are live, but we're not in person live, um, the Zoom platform at least is a little bit better if we can ask some questions and have some dialogue as we go. So I'm looking forward to being here with you guys uh, now for the next 50 minutes. And um, this CPE session is kind of interesting. We're going to talk about really like this broad, um, full spectrum, um, aspects of, of practice management, but really building your business and, and client service and really what we're looking at in terms of the industry as a whole today um, and areas that you can use to kind of implement into your firm or into your practice to help grow that and also to improve your own skill set and improve um, or meet your client needs or exceed your client needs in a lot of different areas. So hopefully the information is helpful. As I said, it's going to be, we're going to tackle a lot of stuff um, and talk about just some ideas. And hopefully that stuff that I can provide to you today will be helpful in terms of things that maybe you haven't thought of, or maybe you have thought of and just haven't taken the next step on. Um, and so if there's any of those things that I can assist you with, I would, would certainly love to do that. That's what we're here for is to be a resource to you, to your practice, to your, to your clients, uh, staff, or just as your, your firm in general. So before I give you an introduction about myself, I wanted to give you a little bit of a 30,000 foot view of kind of the big picture of, of our group. Um, I don't know if you all are familiar with engineered tax services, but we have been in business for about 21 years. We were founded in 1999. And uh, we have grown quite significantly. We're the largest specialty tax firm in the country now and really still work as a boutique firm. Um, our founder, Julio Gonzalez, founded ETS back in 1999. It's kind of a spin out from a big four firm. And the idea was, why can't we provide these same kind of services and the same type of strategies to small to mid-sized clients, business owners, property owners, um, and also CPAs, as what we see a lot of these big four firms are offering to the larger businesses. So Fortune 500, Fortune 100 companies where they're providing cost segregation and engineering studies and, and, uh, and a lot of more of these uh, more complex tax strategies that were applied at that higher level. But it was much more difficult for a smaller firm and for a small client to be able to tap into those kinds of services. And so that's really why we developed engineered tax services. And it was specifically to be able to be a resource to CPA firms so that we could provide value, we could allow those firms to have kind of those added services that you bring into the mix and that you are able to provide to your clients without having to, you know, maybe go out and hire an engineer or have someone really on staff to do some of those things because maybe you only have two cost egg studies a month or um, some other strategy that falls into place. And so the, the model of engineered tax services was really to be a resource and a provider to CPAs. And so we can bring those to the table. We can allow you to have that level of expertise or have a resource. Very much, I always use this, and you can use this for your clients as well. If they ever have questions, they don't understand how we come into the mix. But we use it as talking about the, the medical space. And it's as if you have your family practitioner and the CPA really becomes that family practitioner for them who is looking at their overall well-being and, and their overall structure. However, at times you need to bring in a specialist that has much more in-depth and technical knowledge or is a, is a subject matter expert in a particular area. Uh, we do that, of course, in the medical space. We're going to go find an orthopedic if I've got to have a shoulder surgery or something like that. So that really helps our clients understand 
why we bring in a third party and why we're utilizing some of those outside resources and a network to really build that in. And that's one thing that's amazing for, for groups like MACPA and other CPA associations for really providing a network that you can tap into for a, a myriad of different services. So with that said, Engineer Tax Services has been in business now for 20 plus years. And we have recently also done an acquisition of a group called the Growth Partnership. And the Growth Partnership now consists of three or four other businesses that again, tap into sort of this big picture of, of the offerings that are here to assist and drive into CPA firms to help you grow your practice. And ultimately to shift more from that compliance mindset to much more of an advisory role to where you are really coaching, you're advising, you're, you're giving that advice to your clients to help them grow their businesses and to capture all of these benefits that would be available to them. So when we look at how all this links together, you know, looking at this screen, we start off with, you know, cost segregation and tax credits and incentives and research and development credits. You know, that's on the engineered tax services side, which you see kind of in the blue there, um, really specialized, um, again, subject matter, expert type technical incentives that we can help drill down to. And as we shift down into kind of the green phase, which is the growth partnership aspect, we start to, to get into trusted advisory services, um, soft skill training, training and education programs for individuals and for firms as a whole, uh, really dealing with practice and management, a really big aspect is marketing and growth and how does the firm market itself? And, you know, is there some help that you can get with helping to build a marketing plan or even doing some of that outsourced marketing? So we kind of bring all that under one roof. Another thing that we've brought to the table this year that's really interesting is 5G rooftop um, leasing. So rooftop leasing has been really significant in 2020 as we have moved into COVID. We have a lot of real estate owners who are now struggling because they're in a situation where, uh, you know, rents are down. In fact, I'm in Las Vegas right now. The governor just announced last night that he's extending the moratorium on um, uh, on um, uh, <laughs> evictions. Sorry, um, evictions in multifamily properties. So if someone isn't able to pay their rent, they need to be able to stay. You know, that's that's an incredible resource and value for those individuals who are struggling. They don't have a job and they're not able to pay rent. However, it's a massive strain on those property owners who are owning those properties and they're not able to collect rent and they're not able to evict. Um, so we kind of balance that out. The 5G rooftop leasing is an opportunity to potentially lease a rooftop for 5G towers or Wi-Fi or DISH or some other technology aspect where there could be some significant revenue generated from those leases and very little impact to the property owner. So very, very successful. We've seen a tremendous amount of interest in that this year. I think understandably so in the current environment. Um, so uh, apologize for the long drawn out explanation of kind of the growth partnership and engineered tax services, but I wanted to give you that foundation of ultimately what our group is doing and what we bring to the table so that we can give you um, in this presentation some background for the services we can, we can help you with, um, we can bring to the table, and also just kind of um, educate you a little bit on what's happening in the industry as a whole. So a little bit about myself before we get started. Uh, my name is Heidi Henderson. I split my time between Salt Lake City, Utah and Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, so we're spending the winter in Vegas. It's nice and 60 something degrees, which is and sunny. Um, so no complaints. Um, I have been in specialty tax specifically for about 10 years, but my career now over 25 years uh, is specifically in tax and a lot of it related to um, tax credits and incentives and real estate. So I've always, I am a real estate investor. My partner, who happens to be my sister, as well as Julio, the founder of ETS, we're all real estate investors. Um, and really, really familiar and, and kind of connected into the real estate um, market, as well as a lot of our family office and high net worth individuals that we focus on. So we work in, in a myriad of different um, um, scenarios with different businesses. Um, again, I've been with ETS almost 10 years now and do a lot of speaking, a lot of training, a lot of coaching. We do a lot of consulting on the firm growth aspect and practice management, kind of a lot of different areas. So uh, personally, uh, everybody who knows me as I'm a complete horse fanatic. So when I'm not working, which I work a lot, um, I get to go out and play with horses. 
Uh, my kids are grown. My husband's retired. So uh, normally we travel um, and, and actually travel a lot to speak and go to events and conferences. But with COVID, we're kind of stuck. So look forward to getting back to travel. Hopefully at some point we'll have in-person events back with you guys. And we'll be able to see you in person um, in the near future. So we certainly look forward to that. I'm kind of missing those, um, the fun uh, CPA events and conferences. So today's learning objectives. Um, first off, we're going to talk a little bit about today's environment, meaning for CPA firms or professional service firms, what are we seeing in the environment as a whole? Um, and what are the things that really need to change? What, what needs to give? Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about firm goals and firm culture, uh, culture statements. What's your, over your, your goal of what you're trying to accomplish with your clients? Uh, it's amazing how important and how valuable these types of um, kind of foundational things are and how many firms don't spend the time to really think about that and communicate that out to the public and to their clients. Um, ultimately, what do clients want? Uh, I think it's surprising what we think they want versus what maybe they actually want. So we'll talk about that and then talk a little bit about soft skill training and how to develop yourself not necessarily from the technical expertise, which you're proficient with, um, but more really the soft skill kind of EQ type skill sets. And then rolling into how we can use technology to really help increase and expand our ability to have better soft skills and to deal with our clients better as it trickles down through the topics. Um, and finally, talking about niche services and pulling in a network, having resources that we can refer business to or bring in when we're having those kind of conversations with our clients. So that's kind of how we're going to roll through today. Now, part of our group under the umbrella of um, engineered tax services for family companies or businesses is included the Rosenberg survey. Um, you know, I don't know if you all have heard of the Rosenberg survey. It's one of the largest, there are two surveys ultimately in the CPA industry. The Rosenberg survey has been around for about 23 years. Um, it's really quite significant in terms of the depth that it gets into in driving into the data behind CPA firms and what's happening, um, you know, what billable hours are, how we're working through a lot of that stuff. So it's incredibly insightful in terms of what we see out of that result, out of that survey. Um, and we do have a copy. We have, we, uh, we sell a copy of that survey if you ever want to look at that, but you can also participate in it. Um, the Rosenberg survey is on its 22nd year. We currently have over 338 firms that participate in that survey. It takes some time to actually complete all of that information. Our sweet spot tends to be the firms that are between two to $3 million in annual revenue. We have a very, very high repeat rate. So most of the firms that, that put in for that survey tend to come back and do that year after year. Uh, we have three CPAs and industry professionals who go through a review. Alan Colton has been looking at that as well. Um, and the survey, the 2020 survey, which just came out, is actually, for the most part, part of the 2019 numbers. Um, so we're kind of looking at it at the prior year. We don't have 2020 numbers yet because as we come down to the close of the year, we're going to start that next survey. So mid next year, you're going to start to see the survey results for really what has happened in 2020 under this COVID um, situation and how that's impacted CPA firms, which we're really interested in seeing what that overall impact has been. But the ongoing concerns that we see in the industry and the complaints that we get from a lot of our clients and from the survey results is one increasing staff turnover uh, is one of the difficult things, really understanding how much time it takes to onboard, bring someone in, train them, get them up to speed on your internal processes, and then having them actually leave within a, a you know 12, 18, or 24 months um, is very costly to the firm. So you know, w how can we mitigate that turnover? How can we help avoid the lost costs that go into that training and then losing employees? Uh, so maybe we have some solutions for that. Um, difficulty with staff management is another issue we're hearing, particularly with COVID. Um, you know, we're hearing, oh, this is the new norm. And I think that it really has catapulted us 10 years into the future with being forced to do COVID webinars and COVID meetings and working with people virtually rather than this in-person structure that we've been so used to for so long. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. I think we've seen a lot of adaptation, but in doing so, managing staff, keeping staff engaged, also keeping them feeling socially um, 
interactive really in the full group under sort of a remote working scenario is a whole different ballgame in terms of how we manage those individuals. Um, so we have some ideas with that. Um, getting buy-in, the balance between technical expertise and client service and, you know, how do we balance really taking the time at that client relations aspect, but also there's so much technical expertise that we're required to have as we're going through tax updates and, and um, tax provisions. And this year, right, we had the extended tax returns. Um, we had the PPP loans. We had the CARES Act. We had all of these different changes that we're having to be up to speed on and knowledgeable on so that we can consult with our clients. So how do we handle all this stuff that's being thrown at us? And then also tracking billable hours with our staff, with ourselves, but also our staff. Um, and, and how do we balance that between soft skill training and, and the client relation aspect? Um, so, so there are tools available. There are things that you can do to implement, to, to create an ease in some of those situations and provide you some, um, some additional benefits. So this is interesting. With the staff billable hours, um, we see here that the, the typical billable hours, depending on the size of firm. Now, this firm is from over $2 million. Now, we do have smaller firms that participate in this survey, um, but we see a large number of them fit within this space. And so we've used this slide term, uh, in terms of the number of billable hours that we see um, for those over $2 million firms. So it's interesting to see the number of firms that participated in the survey and how many billable hours they are, they're billing on an annual basis and how that falls. Clearly, we're seeing over 1,400. So again, how do we balance billable hours with taking the time to, to cultivate client relationships and business development and some of those other things? An interesting turn of events that we saw in 2019, and again, we're really interested to see uh, what's going to happen on the 2020 survey, is that for one of the first times we've started to see a decline in annual growth. Um, again, this is firms with um, over $2 million of revenue. But if you look at the average growth rate that we've seen since 2010, and we continue out through the years, we've really kind of seen that fluctuate and then kind of balance out in the you know, upper six to as much as 8% range. However, we've seen a decline in the last couple of years in 2019. We are actually expecting a decline in 2020 um, and are kind of interested to see how this um, is kind of fluctuating. Um, so there are some reasons for that, uh, but something to be aware of when we have firms that are saying, look, our ultimate goal is to have a certain percentage of growth per year. We want to retain new clients. We want to grow our firm and our, and our client service. Um, these are the, the things that we're implementing. Um, we really have to watch these numbers because as we see firms as a whole decline, um, it makes us step back and say, okay, what are we seeing that is ultimately creating this decline in growth and how can we reverse that to push more towards that growth that we're aiming for in our overall business plan. Um, so managing production levels is one. And again, this is that balance that we really try to help provide some coaching and some, some guidance with as we're dealing both with um, the, the practice manager, management aspect and the growth um, uh, as, as it ties to our billable hours, as it ties to our actual production levels. So first off with our staff, how are we managing our staff? I mean, this is one of the biggest issues, setting clear expectations and, and what is the benchmark for what we're trying to achieve with our billable hours. Clearly with this in a, in a COVID situation, if you have employees that are working remotely, then um, being able to manage them, you know, it's, it's a little easier to manage if we're tracking billable hours and we can see what they're billing. If we see billables go down, again, this is something we're really interested to see in this uh, Rosenberg survey for 2020, is if we've seen billable hours go down or maybe we've seen them increase because of this now remote working environment. Uh, so pretty interested to see that. Stay tuned. Um, as I said, in, in about the next five months, we'll see those results out and be able to, um, to share that with everybody. But keeping our staff busy, um, knowing that they are, they are productive, even if they're working at home, and how they're able to really stay integrated within the firm. Providing monthly reports to track our actual versus budgets, really setting those clear expectations for your staff, implementing a formal scheduling system. Um, again, something typically online, something that is some, some type of a... Um, 
um, an infrastructure or technology that you can adopt to really help formally schedule time. Again, if you have staff working remotely, being able to have something that's clear and help them be more organized, help them be more scheduled with how they're going. Um, and then, you know, the next step is really making your firm a really, truly great place to work. Now, we've seen really this fluctuate. You know, I, I have a large firm I work with in Dallas, and, you know, they've got a ping pong table in the middle of the, um, you know, their, their sort of, um, I hate to call it the cow pen, but, <laughs> you know, their area where all their staff is working, lots of people at stand-up desks, we've got people playing ping pong, and, you know, it's, it's a great environment, right? How do we, again, how do we balance that with helping them not only have fun, because it's not just about, hey, I want to make this, you know, the super great place to work that you just love being at. We want people to be treated well. We want them to have, you know, open feedback that's coming back and forth. We want to encourage growth, personal growth in those individuals. One thing I, you know, I read a really fascinating study about millennials. And one of the really interesting things that we're seeing is that in, the, in some of the younger generations, as they're coming into the workforce, they really want more feedback than I think what we've seen in the past. And they want more direct, immediate feedback. They want to know right now, what are you seeing? How can I improve? Where am I you know, exceeding? Where am I um, missing the mark? And what do I need to do right now to fix that? Um, and so that means that as a manager, it's so important for us to, to, to um, adapt to that need to make sure that we're available to coach those individuals because that, even apart from maybe having the highest paycheck, a lot of times you're going to retain staff if you're meeting their needs. And those needs that they're seeking, surprisingly, is that feedback. It's letting them know how they're doing, how you feel about how they're doing, how do they feel about how they're doing, and just making sure that, that you have that, that comfortable environment where they're able to really open that up. And then the second side of it, is in offering non-technical skill training and personal development. So this is something that we have really seen with a lot of staff um, be absolutely thrilled about and create buy-in with the firm. So we have specific uh, soft skill training programs. Uh, we have a whole myriad of them. I have a list and I'll kind of show you what some of those are. But just to give you examples, you know, you could help them learn to be better, better public speakers, um, learn how to give a really good, PowerPoint presentation to a potential client. Teach them good listening skills and business development skills. That's something that most CPAs who are technically proficient have not been trained on with truly how to develop their personal skills when it comes to listening, writing, speaking, um, or even project management. So some of these skills are, are personal skills that as an individual will improve their ability uh, as an individual to handle clients, to communicate with clients, to write better emails, to present more, um, more confidently and with more, um, you know, ultimately with that, with the confidence and the ambition to go out and have those conversations with prospects. And we see a lot of staff members really struggle with that. It does not come naturally for most people. And so the way that we can utilize tools like this or training um, opportunities like this is that if you invest in putting them through specific training programs, you can also write that into their contract, that they have buy-in with the firm, that you have invested in them, and that those investments in them are helping them improve their future, improve their soft skills, and ideally is going to actually come back to you because their ability at better client service ultimately is better for your firm. So that's going to be better with working with clients. It's going to help. It's going to help retain those clients better. It's going to help them gain new clients because they're having conversations with prospects that are interested in looking for a new CPA. So it's very well rounded that at this phase, once you have the technical proficiency, now it's so important to really look at those soft skills and developing those personal traits that we have to be able to be comfortable, whether it's in a Zoom environment. You know, what are the best ways to really present yourself on a Zoom call? And how do you write a PowerPoint presentation? And how do you appropriately write an email after a follow-up call if you've presented a, a proposal to a client? You know, a lot of those soft skill trainings, um, which are incredibly valuable, and again, can help develop that individual, give them buy-in for your firm, 
And again, you, you may be able to structure something that, that gives them a, a longer period of commitment with your firm because you've invested that time and money in helping to develop them further. Um, so those are some of the things that we have seen firsthand be effective um, with working with our, our current staff, keeping them, having that retention, and then also helping them better work with our clients so that, again, we can maintain that client, um, client satisfaction ultimately. So, you know, that's kind of talking about staff. Now I want to shift gears just a little bit, talk a little bit about ultimately goals and vision or the culture within your firm. Now, whether you're a, a $10 million firm or whether, you know, it's you and one other person and you're relatively small, it really doesn't change the fact that this type of vision, that setting the foundational principles and guidance required is so incredibly valuable for really just setting the, the groundwork for who you are and what your goals are with, um, with, with your particular clients. So first, first, um, why does corporate culture matter? You know, there are some things that, that as part of a culture are so significant. Um, I have actually overseen and run all of our marketing for ETS for the last 10 years. Um, we have grown from about $5 million firm nine years ago to about almost a $50 million firm today. Um, a lot of that is marketing and advertising and getting out there and, and, and um, um, you know, clearly what we view as business development. But a lot of that is internal. It's, it's having an amazing team that has buy-in, that believes in the vision, that, um, that, that is happy with where they work. Um, and, and we've developed that. So we created a vision statement or culture statement with our company about 18 months ago, maybe almost two years ago. And one thing that we do is every quarter, we have culture calls. And we actually sit down and, and we talk about and have people give specific examples of something they saw in practice that was the culture statement being played out. And I can tell you that the shift that we've seen in our staff with the way that they communicate with each other, with the way that the emails just internally are communicated, how people treat each other are so significantly different because of the culture statement we set aside in terms of saying we are a team, we are together, we appreciate innovation and ideas, and we will hear those, you know, bring those to the table. All of these different things that we've incorporated to our, in our own culture statement. So it, you know, at first glance, maybe you think, yeah, you know, what does the culture statement have to do with anything? Um, it's amazing how it trickles down from the top, down to your staff, down to your clients. So, so vision. First off, what is the overall vision for your particular company? This really helps orient your clients, your employees, and the public to really who you are. Why are you there? Like, what's your point? What's your story? Um, it is so much more important than you realize, and clients do want to understand sort of the story behind your business, why you've created your business, and what the point is. Second, values. Um, clearly articulating values, it communicates to all of your employees that you have made a vow that they have taken to serve clients. You have made a vow to your clients to serve them the way that colleagues should help and the professional standards that the firm expect from your staff. So it goes both ways. Your staff feels that there's a vow that you have taken and that they also need to take as part of the values of that firm of what they're going to do to meet client needs. Um, and the client sees that as well to what those expectations are. So setting your value statement really sets those expectations, both internally and externally. Practices. Practice what you preach. Preach. The value means that nothing if you're not enshrined in everyday practices. So, so yes, you have your value statement, you have your vision, but you have to preach it. You have to live it. Um, and that ultimately is really what's showing out, again, both internally and externally. People. So no firm will succeed without a unified vision that their staff can stand behind and have really embraced themselves. The best firms are fanatical about recruiting employees who are not just super talented, but they are really well suited to your particular firm culture. So the people that you bring in have to meet the culture. They have to have this um, you know, personality or this trait that, that has buy-in with this ultimate culture that you've developed. It cannot just be simply that you interviewed someone with the right technical skills. 
um, you will find that you become having issues within your staff under that scenario. Um, so having the right people is just key to all of it. And then having a narrative. What is the narrative? It's your story. So why are you here? How can you share that heritage with your clients and your staff? If you have a firm or you're building a firm, why? Why did you become an accountant? Why did you become a CPA? What is your goal? What do you want to accomplish? And how did you get here? Um, so share your story. Share that personal aspect of who you are and how you got here because it matters. Um, and nowadays, um, I'll, I'll tell you a little story about our website. Um, we get on average about 10 to 15,000 visitors on our website a month. Um, pretty good traffic. We did, we had a web company kind of do a review of, of what people click on the most. Um, so someone goes to our home site, what are they looking at? My first thought is um, they're probably going straight to cost segregation or they're wanting to hear about R&D. I was so fascinated because out of 15,000 people a month looking at our website, 48% of the people that visit our website immediately go to meet our team. So they literally go to our homepage and the first thing they do is they wanna see who we are. Um, the second one is case studies. And that one was something like 25%. So, so almost 75% of our total traffic goes to who we are, about us, meet our team, and what kind of projects have we finished and where is our level of expertise? I think that is so insightful because you may think that, hey, you know, what are you doing from a service standpoint? What services do you offer? In fact, it's about who you are. Um, so if I can't just push that idea home, that concept home, people want to know who you are. Um, and that's really one of the biggest things that matter. And then finally, the place. Um, whether you're targeting clients in a particular place, whether it's your ideal employee, um, the environment that you are in shapes the story and it builds upon all of those preceding culture points. So where you're at physically, where you're located, who your client base is, maybe it's online. Okay, then who is your client base and where are you positioning yourself? Um, so that is very important um, aspect as well in terms of really beginning to build your story. So then from there, we look at then practice management. So now we kind of understand what are our goals. We have our, um, we have our goals, we have our culture statement. In terms of practice management, where are we really investing time into then growing our firm and truly seeing that expand? We, we need to invest in personal growth and development, leadership and management skills training, um, not just for staff members needing to really understand those writing and presenting skills and soft EQ communication skills, but then shifting to training for leadership and management. You know, do you have a partner track individual who is really great at working with clients and you see so much potential and they may eventually, you know, grow up into a partner position. If that's the case, give them the opportunities by enrolling them in programs where they can then start to develop those skill sets and become a leader and understand how to manage a business. That's a totally different ball game than just the technical aspect that we see with tax preparation and, and compliance work. So um, really important investment in that space. Consult with industry experts to develop your mission value statements. You know, we, if, if you are not familiar with how to do that, they're an amazing resource. And certainly we would love to work with you. Um, that's why we're sponsoring this. But, but, you know, the point is more so, it's so important to invest in the time and invest in really that big picture strategy. Create your one year and your five year action plans and really know where you want to go, what you want to achieve. It really helps us pull out of that reactionary standpoint, become much more proactive in our day to day planning of what we want to accomplish with our firms. Um, the next step then, of course, is really understanding what your clients want. So we're developing our staff, we're developing ourselves from a personal and soft skill standpoint for, uh, for training and coaching and understanding how best to work with our clients. What ultimately do they want? I thought this was such a great survey because this Journal of Accountancy survey um, surveyed a bunch of clients and asked them specifically, what is it that you want from your CPA? But what ultimately, you know, list them, one through six, what are the most important things? And I thought it was so interesting because in almost every case, I mean, look at these, responsiveness. 
being proactive. Um, so really looking at different opportunities, looking at what's available, looking at what they can, what, what your client can utilize to help reduce tax liability or make sure that they are um, proactively planning for their business's success. Um, they want you to understand their industry. Um, so, you know, obviously becoming then much more niche focused can be extremely valuable, again, which can come out in your culture statement. More frequent communication. So more rather than less. They want to hear from you. They want to know what's happening. Send them updates. Let them know what's going on in the world and what they need to be aware of, not just once a year when it's time to work on their tax prep. Focus more on trends. I thought this was really interesting. Again, they want updates. They want to hear more. They want you to be their advisor. Um, and last, they want you to be more strategic. Uh, so again, not just preparing their tax returns, not just looking through that information, making sure that they're compliant. It's really being more strategic, really looking more at what they can implement to continue to um, improve their own businesses and their own successes. So what does it take to be more strategic? I and mean, we've talked a little bit about this. Um, first off, soft skills training. Um, there are so many amazing programs. This is just a list of our training programs that we offer. Um, in, we, we invest in, uh, we offer staff training to um, in, improve your personal skills over and beyond, uh, beyond your technical training. We have leadership and people development. We've got, these are kind of daily programs we do per firm. Um, we have a partner institute track that is a three-year program for individuals really wanting to get on a partner track and become better leaders and managers. Um, so we have a multitude of different service offerings from the training aspect that we can assist you with. Business development and growth. I mean, one of my favorite ones is the reluctant salesperson. I don't know anybody, well, maybe a few people. I don't know any accountants who love sales, that more than, than the accounting aspect of their job, they want to do, they want to go out and sell. Um, or do business development to close more projects and more deals. This program, the Reluctant Salesperson, is, is amazing. It is a complete spin on really understanding how we run a business and what client service is about and shifts our mindset from really what is sales, what is business development, what is client service, um, because they're pretty closely related. Um, and we have to be aware when we're afraid of those confrontational situations or scenarios and teach ourselves and our staff to be more comfortable in those environments. Um, so, so many programs available to continue to expand and improve your own skill sets and your staff skill sets for completing that growth. The next thing that I would suggest, client service and technology. Your clients want more. And today's clients, the client relations management tools, they are easier than ever. They're, they are automated with most of the programs today. Um, this is an Accounting Today article about really staying in touch with CRM. Now, I will preface this. I'm biased because we own ABLE. ABLE is a CRM platform specifically for CPA firms. Jeff Paolau is our founder of ABLE. He actually developed this platform um, he is amazing and has been very heavily integrated into this industry for the past 25 years. Um, but there are other Zoho, there are other um, CRM options. I mean, ETS actually uses Zoho CRM. There's HubSpot, Walters Kluwer, Microsoft Dynamics, and again, Able is one specifically for CPAs. So when we're talking about client relations, when we're looking at the list of what do your clients want, I can tell you right now that this type of a program is so incredibly valuable because one, it helps you really manage your client relations. You know who your clients are, you know how long it's been since you last communicated with them. Everything's color coded so you can really see how long has it been, what am I missing on, when do I need to touch base. The, the next aspect to most of these programs, um, I know ABLE specifically, also has a mailing program where there is news articles listed every single day in, in industry publications that are valuable and vetted and, and um, um, you know, not fake news, <laughs> good quality substance. And the, the CRM actually allows you to identify a specific client or a group of clients and what their interests are. Maybe you have a, a, a sector of clients who are real estate centric. If that's the case, then you can pull up all of your real estate clients and send them one email with this new thing that came out that, you know, bonus depreciation is shifted or, 
or better yet, this year, the qualified improvement property rules got extended. I want to send this out to every one of my owners who owns a building where this might impact them. Um, you can very quickly do that, send a personalized email to each of those individuals through this CRM system and keep them up to speed. So you're meeting those needs of the client that's saying, we want you to be more proactive. We're wanting you to communicate more often. We want you to understand our industry. Um, all of those things can be met with a, a meaningful CRM program um, to help automate those things. Because otherwise it's incredibly difficult, obviously, um, to know who all of your clients are and keep those up to date. Um, so, so CRM can be incredibly valuable when it comes to the client service component. And then finally, marketing. Uh, marketing is something that, um, do you put the cart before the horse? Now, this is kind of an interesting situation. The way that the growth partnership was developed, it started out as an outsourced marketing firm for CPAs. Um, so CPAs who did not or had the resources to go out and hire a marketing team or a, an in-house marketing um, director and then you know, a team under them uh, would ultimately um, kind of not have that or one of the partners would try to take on some of those activities. So the growth partnership developed an outsourced marketing group, and, and that is one aspect of the growth partnership, that we can do all of that marketing for you, all outsourced in one location at a fraction of the cost of what it would hire to you know, hire a marketing director or a marketing team for that matter. Um, especially when we're thinking of everything that encompasses marketing, it's your website, it's your social media, it's SEO, which is like your Google Analytics. Um, local advertising, getting it out to the public in your area, thought leadership and content, writing articles, graphic design, branding, what does your logo and your letterhead look like? Does everything look consistent and nice? And then ultimately selling your brand and your business. So there are so many components to marketing. It's very difficult, if not impossible, to hire one individual who can really fill all those needs. Um, you know, we're building a marketing team. We actually have six people on our marketing team in addition to four other companies we outsource to. Um, so, so there's a lot that encompasses marketing and, and that's on the engineered tax services side. Whether you do in-house or whether you outsource those services, you know, here's a little chart you can use. There's a PDF of this PowerPoint you can refer to. You can do it either way. You know, you can do your marketing in-house. If you're a small firm, um, you can utilize some outsourced um, uh, groups when you need certain levels of expertise, um, but there's a lot of information out there. You know, we specifically do marketing audits, which is a one-time fee. We audit it and provide you a 24-month marketing plan. That way you know exactly, here's the plan that we should follow and these are our goals for growth. Um, or you use the outsourced marketing and essentially they're doing everything for you. Um, so you have a lot of options um, in the marketplace for being able to grow that. But I will reiterate, that marketing will drive leads. So if you don't have the capacity or the communication skills and the presenting skills and the, the customer relation skills to cultivate those individuals and those prospects, then it becomes a problem. This is really how the growth partnership has evolved. We started out as a marketing group and then evolved into more of the soft skills training because we could drive the leads through marketing, but we couldn't get the leads closed. And so we realized that's why we're seeing that there's a lack of soft skills in the EQ and the communication and the writing skills and the, you know, the reluctant salesperson type um, mentality. And so it, it goes hand in hand, having those improved soft skills to really build your business um, in relation to having good marketing to actually drive leads and help you grow. Um, so they do go hand in hand. And a lot of those really need to come together to utilize all of those. And then finally, one of the big issues we're hearing this year is major issues with staffing. Um, again, it's difficult to find staff. We can't find anyone trained. We can't keep them on staff. We have all this turnover, a lot of issues there. Um, we do have an executive search and placement team. Um, our team is very, very reasonable in terms of pricing. It's less costly than most typical recruiters if you were to find an outside recruiter. Um, and our team specializes only in, in identifying and finding talented accountants, CPAs, you know, people with the, the correct um, uh, background and, and technical education that is required for a certain position. 
And then the other side is that you can always look at outsourcing. Um, there are some really interesting groups. There's one particular group that I have talked with multiple times. They are offshore. They're outside the United States, but they have incredible staff, highly educated CPAs, understand the U.S. tax code, are incredibly knowledgeable, and they become your staff member, but they are managed ultimately by this outsourced group um, that is bringing them in um, to work solely for you. Um, so there is the opportunity, and I, I don't see, I almost don't see enough firms take advantage of that, because if you are spending most of your time on compliance, and you don't really have time for that client relations aspect to really cultivate the relationships and grow your business, maybe it makes sense to outsource the compliance stuff, some of these simpler tasks, and have someone do those things where you can spend the majority of your time more on cultivating relationships. Um, and more of that advisory, more of coaching your clients, meeting with them, spending time really developing those relationships, which, you know, converts to referrals and other clients and all of those other things. Um, so certainly consider outsourcing. Um, it's amazing how far it's come over the years. And again, with technology, it's incredible how effective it can be. And then finally, in the last couple of minutes, I want to really highlight the importance of strategic partnerships. Um, you know, do your due diligence, be familiar with what is out there in terms of incentives that might be applicable for your client. So they're not leaving money on the table. Um, in terms of specialty tax, you know, we provide a lot of, of the specialty tax services, everything from cost egg, R&D, IC disc, new market, historical tax credits, loan housing credits, 17090, 45L. Um, we can do a whole nother presentation in, in all of these topics. Um, all of these are credits and deductions that are available for business owners or for people owning real estate or doing different types of, um, of business, um, you know, manufacturing or production. So a lot of those things are, are very valuable. And in terms of building further partnerships, CPA associations like this one, um, marketing, having strategic partners to assist you with, with growing your marketing firm. Financial planning is something that we've really started to see a lot of firms implement and, and tap into their current compliance, um, um, compliance practice. Uh, captive insurance, 1031 exchanges and DST exchanges, um, conservation easements. You know, we have an incredible network. We, we don't do those things. All I'm saying is that we have a network of people that are amazing in these spaces and incredibly knowledgeable. So make sure that you have a Rolodex that is really robust. We have access to these individuals and be that resource for your client rather than saying, oh, yeah, here's someone's number. Give them a call. You know, make an email introduction. Hand walk them into that conversation. I implore CPAs all the time. Instead of just making an email introduction and saying, hey, yeah, um, Heidi is the person. Give her a call. Um, send an email. Let's set up a call collectively and have the conversation and make it much more personable, much more dynamic in terms of our conversation and support that we provide for clients through those practices. Um, I did include this brief chart. Again, there's a PDF of this PowerPoint that you can utilize. Um, this chart has kind of thresholds for the different things uh, that will trigger a certain study. When does a cost egg a good fit? Honestly, pretty much anybody with real estate, even a single family rental property is a great fit for cost egg. Um, and we've got some parameters here that you can look at. R&D credits, you know, I've got a, a threshold here. If they've got over $250,000 a year in, in R&D costs, let's have a conversation and look at that. Um, 179D and 45 l for energy efficient buildings. You know, here's the amounts of what those are. This is who is a good fit for those. So a chart like this can help just be aware of what's available, be aware of kind of the trigger for when to have a conversation with a client and when that can bring some value to them and provide that benefit to them that really is reflective to your client that you're looking out for their best interest and you're really thinking about what is a good fit for them. Um, in terms of cost seg with bonus depreciation, you know, really quickly without doing cost seg without bonus, you know, the, the annual depreciation for a building purchased for 2.5 million would be about 64,000. With depreciation or excuse me, with cost segregation, it's over 794,000. So the, the drastic difference in the depreciation benefit is just astronomical. Um, those are things to be aware of and just have the conversation with your client. You know, even if they can't use the depreciation, let them know it's an option. 
um, so that they know that you're looking out for their best, best interest and you're thinking outside the box. Two other changes that I wanted to just hit on really quick, which are more tax technical rather than practice management, of course, are the CARES Act, where we've seen the qualified improvement property rules expanded or, or added back uh, for improvements to real estate. Again, qualifying for bonus depreciation as well. Um, and also the five-year carryback rule, which really just sort of revives again the benefit of a lot of these incentives that can be brought to the table where a client could actually carry them backwards, potentially generate refunds um, based on NOL that then they're carrying down because they've applied a cost tag or they did R&D credits or um, something along those lines. So, so many changes this year. They are important things to be aware of, but really it's so much more about being a strategic advisor to your clients, thinking about them and their needs and understanding where are their pain points how can I help? How can I communicate more often? How can I reach out to them from much more of a soft skill standpoint? And if I'm not comfortable with that, what can I do to improve myself, to improve my staff, and to continue to expand that so that the message that we're putting out to the public, whether it's on our website, whether it's in social media, or whether it's in a conversation, um, that they see our commitment to superior service, um, and to excellence in terms of our knowledge as well as our willingness to be able to help and assist them. Uh, it's a huge differentiator when you're competing with someone else in the marketplace and so much value. Um, so that essentially wraps up our program. Uh, I don't see any questions. If you do have any questions, please drop them in the Q&A box over there. I'm happy to answer or, or address any of those. But, you know, it's been an absolute pleasure to sit with you today. I hope some of this information resonated and kind of made you think about some things that you can tweak or adjust within your own firm or your own practice. Um, but please reach out. My contact information is here, my phone number and my email address. If there's anything that I can assist you with, um, I am more than happy to schedule a call or have a conversation or email about um, how we can help and, you know, questions on any of these services that we might be able to um, bring to your firm and really help you continue to grow your practice. So thank you again so much for attending. It was absolutely wonderful. Love MACPA. So let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.